What's going on, gang? How are you? I hope you're having an awesome day, whatever day it is for you when you're seeing this. If this is your first time to my channel, welcome. I'm so happy that you stumbled upon me. There are videos on this channel with serious, legitimate info that can help heal more than 90% of any health, wellness, or body image challenge. So please do check out the other videos on this channel. I am a holistic health practitioner. I have also overcome an eating disorder, and all of the videos on this channel are about me sharing my extensive knowledge and my life experience with you to help you reach your health, wellness, and body image goals way more efficiently than you might have otherwise thought. Anyhow, without further ado, let's talk about what we're going to do today. There are some interesting articles that I come across, and I have come across one all about the 21 new things that scientists have discovered regarding sex. How scandalous. So we're gonna learn together. I'm just gonna read these out, react to them, see what they say, and I just wanted to share that with you because I think it's really interesting. It is 2020. You know, you'd think we'd know everything about sex that we should know by now as humans who need to participate in such things for procreation. Hey dad, check out my abstinence ring. It means I made a pledge not to have sex. That's crazy. You can't give up sex. You've got a responsibility. Let's read this list and see what's going on. 21 things that scientists have discovered about sex in 2019. What has or is about to happen? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Women are still struggling to talk about what they want in bed. Excuse? I am gonna have regular sex with you whether you like it or not. Okay, women. Now, I am, I wanna say I'm shy. I know that that's very hard to believe considering my channel, its content, what I do for a living. I am out on all of the social medias, but I am really shy and I'm not one to go blabbing about sex everywhere. I know, I'm doing it on the internet right now, but regardless, I can understand the sensitivity with wanting to confide in your partner what you might want in bed. <laughs> it's like... It's so embarrassing, you know? Ugh. You know, sex has always been such a faux pas thing these days. It's nerve wracking to try to ask for something that you find pleasure in or that maybe you haven't tried but you'd like to try to see if it's pleasurable for you. I think when it comes to relationships in general, but especially when it comes to being intimate in relationships, I really think communication is absolute key. I mean, can we all agree on that? Communication is so key. So it says more than half of American women were still struggling to talk about what they wanted sexually in 2019. What year is it? My goodness gracious. A study published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior found that 55% of women, more than half, reported experiencing situations in which they wanted to communicate with their partner. Why didn't they? Why didn't they? They just decided not to say anything. One in five women didn't feel comfortable talking about their sexual desires at all. And one in 10 had never experienced sex in which she felt like her partner valued her sexual pleasure. Okay, I have linked below a video that I made on the magical mysteries of the female orgasm. In that video, I also discussed the fact that Quite a few women have had experiences where she didn't feel as though her own pleasure was valued in bed with her partner. That's not gangster. That's not gangster. I'm not sure where the lines are getting crossed here. I'm not sure if the partner legitimately did not value her pleasure, which, my goodness. Don't be intimate with someone that doesn't value your pleasure. To me, intimacy is not about getting, it's about giving. So dudes, ladies, doesn't matter who you are, you need to value your partner's pleasure. And if you don't value their pleasure, that might be worth a question on why. Are you with the right partner? Are you not feeling like you're receiving enough 
displeasure from them. Talk about it, folks. Talk about it because I guarantee you every single guy out there, including me as a woman, and probably every single woman out there, would feel really awesome about their partner saying, listen, I really like this or I'd like to try this. That's great. You know, give me hints of what you want. I think it's relieving for partner A to feel relieved so that partner B is giving them all the answers without having to try to figure out how to read them and what they like, which is also very important, but communication is key. And I am sure every guy that I know, at least off the top of my head, would be very open to their partners inquiring to them on what they would like or something that they want to try. Le clitoris. Just saying the word clitoris out loud is linked to better sex for women. Give me a C, give me an L, give me an I and T. <laughs> I haven't read their blurb yet. My theory on this is that that goes hand in hand with the communication aspects. Yeah. Like, if you're able to say clitoris out loud, you must be able to further discuss your desires and get some, you know, resolution happening there. Let's see what they say. Mainstream narratives and norms around sex prioritize P in B penetration as the main act of sex, despite the fact that the majority of clitoris owners can't get off from that alone. That's a shame. So this further proves how important the clit is. Okay. Mm. Yes. The clit is very, very, very important, as is the G-spot internally. But how... I mean, there's no one specific spot. A lot of men believe that the G-spot is the way to go to deliver an orgasm. A lot of men believe that jackhammering away on that clitoris is gonna do it. I think all parts of the anatomy are very important. I mean, dudes. Imagine a woman paying a lot of attention to your shaft, but not his little buddies. Just saying. It says, the same study cited above found that just being comfortable using the word clitoris is associated with greater sexual satisfaction and being less likely to fake orgasms. Don't fake orgasms, okay? Don't. Do it! You're not gonna make your partner feel bad if you're unable to climax with them. All you need to do is, first of all, this has been scientifically proven to boil down a lot to what's going on mentally in the woman. Again, that female orgasm video is below. But if you are faking an orgasm, you're never going to achieve the level of satisfaction that you'd like because, first of all, that is a form of lying to your partner. I mean, it truly is. If you're faking an orgasm, they think that they've succeeded at giving you one or helping you to achieve one. You know, it's not going to be nice when, if it ever comes out and they all of a sudden realize that they have never been able to pleasure you, that's going to make them feel horrible, even worse. You're never going to be totally satisfied. I don't understand the point in faking an orgasm. If you do, comment below. Let me know. I don't, yeah, if, you, if you're if you done and you just want it to be over and you know you're not going to reach that, just say that. Like, no fakey fakey, okay? And here's the gold. When you're comfortable talking about sex, including the specific body parts where you like to get touched, you're way more likely to convey that to your partners and then get the type of stimulation that actually feels good for you. Well, obviously. Did I not say that? Next. Not all orgasms are good. <laughs> what? Okay, scientists discovered this? You don't say. Of course not all orgasms are good. You know, I have met women who are able to squirt, and I understand that that is the general male population's directive, is to try to achieve the squirting orgasm. You know, that's not the best feeling orgasm. Yeah, it works, but... Apparently, that orgasm doesn't actually feel the best to most women. Most women that I have spoken to about sex and sexual intercourse have said that it's often their quietest, most silent orgasms that actually feel the best. So, obviously to the partner, it's gonna look the opposite, but no, not all orgasms are good. That seems a little silly. And again, in the archives of sexual behavior, researchers found that 55% of people had experienced a bad orgasm. What? If you have never and yours have all been amazing, comment that below because that's interesting. I've never heard of such a thing. Okay. Bad orgasms, including ones that physically hurt, orgasms that didn't feel as pleasurable as past orgasms, or orgasms that happened in sexually coercive contexts, such that having the orgasm led to intense psychological turmoil. 
I understand that. Okay, number four. People in relationships really are having less sex. What? That just makes no sense. I don't know. I mean, it's just bull I would never judge anyone or whatever they choose to do with their own intimacy. Personally. I would think that it's much easier to achieve having more sex when you're in a relationship than not. Seems fairly obvious. I've never been a Tinder person. I've never gone on Tinder. I don't know, but let's see what they say. Experts have been talking about a so-called sex recession for the last year or so, in which several different data reports have been showing people are having less sex these days than in generations prior. That also surprises me. With the way society is now and everyone is so much more sexually liberal and all of the gender things going on in our society these days, seems like people are much more comfortable sexually in my opinion. However, one multi-year study published in the BMJ this year found the majority of the dip is happening among married people and cohabitating couples. Some of their key findings state that in 2001, 38% of women and 30% of men in serious relationships had no sex in the past month. In 2012, that number jumped to 51% for women and 66% for men in serious relationships. That don't make no sense. And what's more, even sexually active couples were having less sex than usual. In 2012, just 48% of women and 50% of men in serious relationships reported having less sex at least four times in the last month, meaning about half of couples are having less sex than once a week. Why? I can't live like this. I don't know, but that seems sad. I think people should be intimate with each other. Like, why would you have Okay. Millennials don't think they're in a sex recession. So apparently the big story of the moment is that millennials aren't having sex. Why aren't millennials having sex? Why aren't they really just giving it a just and putting it on Snapchat? Okay, are these Scientists, millennials, I'm confused. Cosmopolitan conducted a nationally representative survey on over a thousand people, but their findings show that 71% of millennials feel personally satisfied, which is in quotations, with how much sex they're having, and 62% of millennials think their findings are having plenty of sex too. So maybe it's all relative. Moving on. Commitment and better sex are linked. Okay, again, personally, I believe that if you are with a committed partner, your sex would be better. I would feel much more relaxed having intimacy with someone if I was committed and they were committed. It just makes you feel more comfortable. Who are you with, Michael? Perhaps to many people that's uncomfortable. Again, it's crying, man. It was nothing. It's subjective, I believe, but researchers surveyed hundreds of couples in several weeks of couples therapy to ask about their commitment levels and sex lives each week. In the Journal of Sex and Marital Therapy, their study found commitment and good sex were definitely linked. The reverse was also true. Feeling more committed to each other one week was associated with the couple having better sex the following week. The two seemed to feed off each other. I believe this also because I've heard from several friends of mine, and I know from even going on family vacations, if you and your spouse go on a vacation together, it's going to bring you closer. You're going to feel closer. You're going to want to be closer with each other. I just believe that definitely having a week where you are bonded more closely in commitment would spur on better sex the following week. Number seven, people who love casual sex are more committed to their relationships when those relationships are consensually non-monogamous. Okay, here's what I gathered from that. If the relationship is non-monogamous, meaning you're not only committed to each other, they're more committed to their relationships if they love casual sex. What? Okay, I don't even have, I have nothing. I got nothing. If you think people who love casual sex are inherently less committed in their relationships, Thank you. A study published in the Archives of Human and Sexual Behavior found that in consensually non-monogamous relationships, enjoying casual sex, aka sociosexuality, never heard that term before, was associated with being more committed to your relationship. Not that 
I'm still confused. I'm still confused. Childhood trauma is associated with less sexual satisfaction in adulthood. Yeah, I could see that. You know, if you've had a traumatic experience in your past, you're gonna still be a little closed off likely unless you've had help, in which case, please try to get help. But they say why is because a kid is associated with experiencing more daily psychological distress and with being less mindful to qualities that affect one's ability to engage and feel pleasure during sex. Yeah, I could see that. Number nine, more than half of seniors are unhappy with their sex lives. You'd think they'd be more happy with their, you'd think by the time you're a senior, you got your shit together in that arena. I don't know. You've had all of the practice. You might be less shy as a senior. Maybe you're not as attracted to your peer options. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever thought about that as a young person? Like, when I'm 80, am I going to be attracted to 80-year-olds? Anywho, let's see what they say. It might be true of the theory having less sex when you get older, but it might not because seniors want less sex. Oh, okay. So they're just not as randy. Make a wish. I wish I can satisfy my wife. A study published in the journal PLOS One, and it's P-L-O-S, PLOS One, found 58% of men and women between the ages of 55 and 74 are not satisfied with their sex lives. Oh, I hate it. No, I hate it. In another study published in the journal Menopause, 78% of the more than 4,000 postmenopausal women surveyed were sexually inactive. Of these sexually inactive women, the top reasons for not having sex were not having a partner, I mean, that can kind of put a damper on your sex life. Having a partner with a medical condition that makes sex out of the question, or having a partner dealing with sexual dysfunction. Okay, so it's not really that, well, I guess the options are a little bit limited, but so is the, uh, mood, perhaps. Okay, number 10. These three key factors reliably turn women on. Three key factors. All right, a study of 662 straight women identified three factors that made women more likely to experience sexual desire for someone. Intimacy, feelings of closeness and deep affection. Yeah, feeling closeness and that intimacy emotionally does definitely turn women on. On the contrary though, the second thing that they're saying turns women on the most is celebrated otherness meaning seeing yourselves together as a single unit and object of desire affirmation. Otherwise, what you call love is loving a projection, loving a fantasy, a person being like you are. Seeing yourselves as a separate entity from your partner instead of seeing yourselves together as a single unit. The precondition for love is the discovery of otherness, but it's the discovery of otherness without judgment you find that this person you're living with is not you and they're not like the fantasy you wish they were. They are themselves. And when that happens, a transformation of consciousness occurs. And obviously, hand in hand with that, object of desire affirmation. So being told that you're desirable. Who doesn't want to know that they're desirable? Everybody wants to know that they're desired and they're desirable. And you know what? It can go a long way in your sex life or if you're single and you would like to experience extracurricular activities, making other people feel desired will go a long way. If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. So, because it's already taken this much time and I've only gone through 10, there are 21, I have 11 more questions. I'm gonna throw that in a part two video, so please stay tuned for that. Right now I'm uploading every single weekend. If you thought this video was helpful, informative, or entertaining at all, please Hit that thumbs up button down there for me as that lets me know what kind of content to keep producing for you. If you would like notifications of each time I post new video, including part two of this one, please hit that little bell notification icon down there and you will be sent a notification each time I upload. Please please subscribe to this channel. Subscribing really is where all of the support comes from for me. It's completely free to subscribe. I can't even explain how much that does for me on my end. I really appreciate it. Please share the channel because like I say, there are so many videos on here other than silly ones like this that can really help people achieve their health, wellness, and body image goals. Until next time, have super amounts of fun in your life. Have super amounts of fun communicating about sex with your partner and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Well, that was awkward. Yes, it was. Sort of a private conversation. Very much a family type moment. We didn't need to hear any of mm -hmm. that.